Hello, and welcome to my channel, Reading Little Blue Books, out loud. This is a little blue book. It happens to be little blue book number 493, and it is titled New Discoveries in Science, written by Hereward Carrington, Ph.D., and that is H-E-R-E-W-A-R-D, Hereward. It's not a name you hear of too much anymore. Ha! All right, this is part three, and uh, we left off at the bottom of page 23 with a new chapter beginning soap bubbles and what they teach us. Blowing soap bubbles may strike you as a very childish amu amusement, but from them there is much to be learned of scientific interest. The soap bubble, as ordinarily blown, by means of a bubble pipe contains within it carbon dioxide gas given off by the lungs. The coat of the soap bubble composed of a mixture of soap and water is elastic and capable of being stretched or pulled in different directions without being broken. In order to give greater strength and elasticity to this film a mixture of soap, water and glycerin may be employed. Common yellow soap is better than most of the fancy soaps. Castile soap will furnish an excellent soap bubble mixture. If the soap bubble be examined, it will be found that various beautiful colors are reflected upon its surface. These colors are usually very delicate and consist largely of pinks, blues, and greens. After a few seconds, a darkish spot begins to appear at one point on the surface of the bubble. This spot becomes darker until it is almost black, and almost immediately after this, the bubble bursts. This black spot is in reality the thinnest portion of the bubble of the soap bubble, and it is at this point that the film gives way first. The soap bubble skin has at this point become so thin that it will no longer reflect light rays. Soap bubbles have even furnished us a means of determining the size of the molecules of matter. Knowing the amount of soap and water employed in order to produce a definite bubble, the size of the bubble when blown is measured and in this way the number of molecules of soap and water in any given square centimeter of its surface can be calculated. The thickness of the film may be determined by the coloring of the bubble. Knowing the area and thickness of the soap bubble film and number of molecules can be calculated and in this way it has been ascertained that approximately a given number of molecules of matter are contained within that space. This elastic coat, which we see in soap bubbles, may also be noted in other mixtures such as alcohol and water. The strength of this skin may be seen on the side of a wine glass, in which there is some fairly strong wine such as port. The liquid is observed to climb up the sides of the glass and then to gather into drops and run down again, and this goes on for a long time. This is explained as follows. The thin layer of wine on the side of the glass, being exposed to the air, loses its alcohol by evaporation more quickly than the wine in the glass. It therefore becomes weaker in alcohol or stronger in water than that below, and for this reason it has a stronger skin. It therefore pulls up more, than, more wine from below, and this goes on until there is so much that drops form and run back again into the glass. There can be no doubt that this movement is re referred to in Proverbs 23.31. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. Much more might be said on this interesting topic, but the above will at least serve to show us that we can learn facts of great interest, even from the lowly soap bubble. What spinning tops teach us? Are we in danger of reverting to a second childhood when we study the action of spinning tops? By no means, for we can learn much of great scientific value in consequence and even throw light upon certain astronomical phenomena by an analysis of their motion. 
Spinning bodies behave in a very different manner than the same bodies do at rest. For example, you can loop a chain over a wheel which is then revolved with considerable rapidity. If now the chain is suddenly disengaged, it will go running off like a solid hoop and will only collapse in an inert mass when it comes to relative rest. If you throw a coin into the air, it will come down anyway. But if you give it a rapid spinning motion when throwing it upwards, it will always come down with the same side upwards as when it started. For example, if heads is on top when thrown, it will invariably come down heads. The same thing is true for a hat, an ink bottle, or any other object. Another curious thing is that a spinning body, such as a top, can maintain its balance at an angle, seemingly against the pull of gravity, when the same body would at once fall to the floor when at rest. A gyroscope top is a good example of this. It will lean far over to the side, but it will not fall. Its spinning motion holds it in place. If our Earth were to stop its spinning motion, it would fall into the sun at once, and we should all be burned alive. When a top is spinning, it begins to wobble, and these oscillations gradually increase until the top falls to the ground. If, when the top is still, you hit it a smart blow in a north and south direction, it will at once begin to wobble in an east and west direction, and vice versa. All spinning bodies tend to rise up onto their longest axis. Thus, if you spin an egg rapidly, it will end up on it will get up on end and only settle back onto its side as it slows down to, in its speed. Again, all spinning bodies tend to point to the pole star. That is why the north pole of our Earth is pointed in that direction. Every top, every wheel of every factory, and on every train and automobile in the country, when in revolution, is gently tugged to turn its axis to point toward the north star. This is a remarkable and little known fact. Of course, the energy of the spinning body may not be sufficiently strong to affect this, but the effort of the spinning body is there nevertheless, and, if allowed to spin long enough and given free play, will be found ultimately to point in that direction. An electric electronically driven gyroscope will prove this. In fact, there is a very interesting interesting example. Nope, experiment. There's an interesting, interesting experiment based upon this fact, by means of which the revolution of the Earth on its axis may be seen going on before the eyes of the spectator, even if he is in a dark dungeon in the bowels of the Earth. How a single stone has influenced history. New chapter. Just 100 years ago, a flat stone was discovered in Egypt which has revealed the secrets of that ancient civilization, and has, in fact, supplied us with a key to the dim past. For centuries, the Egyptian hieroglyphics remained a mystery. No scholar could read them, since there was no means of beginning their interpretation. It was realized that, if these hieroglyphics could be read, they would reveal to us much concerning the civilization of ancient Egypt, the life, art, and science. When excavating in Upper Egypt, M. Jean Champollion, yeah, Champollion discovered a flat stone, since known as the Rosetta Stone, because it was discovered near the Egyptian port of Rosetta. This stone had cut in its surface an inscription in two languages, Egyptian and Greek. Further, the Egyptian language was written both in the older form of hieroglyphics and in the more modern Demo demotic characters. It seemed obvious that all three of these probably referred to the same thing, and that the demotic and Greek lettering were but modern variations or translations of the earlier hieroglyphic script. It therefore became the object of Egyptian students to attempt the translation of the hieroglyphics, with the other languages as partial keys. The translation was gradually affected as follows. It was first of all assumed correctly that a continuous line about certain figures indicated a royal name. This is known as a cartouche, 
It was also assumed that if the cartouche contained the name of Potlame, the characters in it would have the sounds of the Greek letters, since the Greek was an attempted translation. A stone had already been found known to contain the name of Cleopatra, some of the letters of which were the same as in the name Potlame. For example, I is the second letter in Cleopatra, nope, L is the second letter in Cleopatra, and the fourth letter in Potlame. P is the fifth letter in Cleopatra, and the first in Potlame, etc. Now, in examining the two stones, certain hier hieroglyphics were found to be the same. For example, a bird occurred in one name, and apparently stood for a certain letter, where it should stand in both names according to their spelling. This bird was therefore translated as A. In a similar manner, a sign resembling a closed mouth was translated as R. A sign resembling a folded umbrella was translated as E, etc. In this way, letter by letter, the whole alphabet was gradually worked out, and the message deciphered. After this, the interpretation of the Egyptian hieroglyphics became merely a matter of time and study. And today, they can be read almost with felicity. No, faculty. Yeah, almost be read with faculty. We know, we now know much more of an ancient history than any previous generation. So, so that the further we progress from ancient times, the more we know concerning them. All this has been rendered possible by the discovery of a single piece of stone. New chapter. New theories as to the formation of our Earth. When we look at a map or globe of the world, we are struck by several peculiarities which require explanation. In the first place, nearly every peninsula, large and small, points towards the south. And this is even true of vast bodies such as Africa, South America, and India. Secondly, the distribution of the land and water upon the surface of the earth is peculiar. Nearly all the land lying in the northern hemisphere, while the water occupies the southern half of the globe. Further, if a map be made of the land area of the northern hemisphere, looking at a globe from the point of view of the North Pole, and this be laid over a singular map, a similar map, drawn from the point of view of the South Pole, it will be found that the land hardly ever falls on land, but that land in one hemisphere almost invariably coincides with water in the other. The only exception to this rule of any importance is that a portion of South America will be found to lie over a portion of northern China. Why is this? One of the newer theories of the formation of our Earth explains these odd facts in a rather ingenious manner. It has been shown that a spherical or round body, when subjected to great pressure, tends to collapse into an angular or tetrahedral form. The reason for this is that a tetrahedron presents the greatest amount of surface of any body next to a sphere. A tetrahedron is composed of four equilateral triangles and may readily be constructed by cutting four triangles of the kind out of cardboard and pasting them together at the edges. When it will be found that you have a top shaped figure with a flat surface at the top and a point at the bottom. Now it has been found by recent researchers that our earth is slightly top shaped. This is doubtless due to the tendency of the Earth to collapse into a tetrahedron yeah. as it cools and contracts, whereas there is also a tendency for the Earth to maintain its spherical form by reason of its rotation. If this tetrahedron, constructed of cardboard, be examined, it will be found that the sides are much nearer the center of gravity of the figure than the points, and if water could be made to stay upon the surface of this figure, it would naturally tend to flow onto the smooth sides, leaving the points exposed. These points would then be found to correspond roughly with the continents or, surf or earth surfaces of our globe, while the oceans would be found to correspond largely with the smooth surfaces.
There are, of course, differences to be noted, such as the large land area, which is not to be found on the South Pole, but in its thought that these changes of land and water areas of our globe have been gradually brought about through millions of years until they present the approximate surfaces which with, with which we note today. This theory at least explains many facts which before had been puzzling and there is much to be said in its favor. It was suggested by Mr. Lothian Green of Cambridge, England. Never heard of that theory. New chapter. What keeps the sun hot? It's a good question. The question of the sun's heat is one which concerns us in a very vital manner. Since all, since all life upon the earth is directly dependent upon the sun's radiations and were these cut off, all forms of life would soon become extinct. Until about a hundred years ago, it was thought that the sun was merely an enormous body of fire and that the heat emitted from it was of the same character as that emitted by a grate of burning coals. This was the chemical theory of the sun's heat and it was thought to be no more mysterious than the combustion noted in many furnaces, only, of course, on a faster scale. This purely chemical theory had to be given up when it was shown that at any ordinary rate of combustion, the heat emitted by even so large a body as the sun would be exhausted in a few tens of thousands of years, whereas the course of evolution on our Earth shows us that life has been continuous here for many millions of years with practically no variation of heat upon this Earth's surface. Certainly, therefore, the purely chemical theory of combustion does not suffice, and other theories were accordingly advanced in attempts to explain the maintenance of the sun's heat. It was first of all suggested that, as the sun cools, it contracts, and that this contraction tended to raise the heat and consequently its temperature, would be maintained for a long period of time. But again, it was proved that if such were the case, the heat of the sun would have been expanded millions of years ago. The theory was then advanced that the sun's heat was maintained by the impact upon its surface of quantities of meteors and other small bodies which crashed into it, being attracted by the enormous pull of gravitation exerted by the sun. We know that heat is generated by friction or rapid impact and it was suggested that this might be one of the long period this might be one of the uh, one of the long period of time that does not make sense it was suggested that this might be one of the long period of time but again it was proven mathematically that this would entirely fail to account for the continuous and steady heat emitted by our central luminary one of the largest th one of the latest theories is that the sun's heat is maintained by the activity of radium and that the constant flow of energy which has been noted uninterruptedly for so many millions of years is due to the intra-atomic energy of the atoms composing it. We know that radium can continue to give off energy for thousands of years, and that even a minute speck of it has a life of an extraordinary length. It has been argued that the heat of our Earth is also of some extent maintained by the quantities of radium hidden beneath its surface in the deeper layers of the Earth's crust. Of late, however, even this theory has been questioned, and it must be admitted that, today, the heat of the sun remains an unsolved problem. It remains for the future to determine the exact nature and causation. New chapter. What happens to aviators? You know what? I think I'll leave that for the next part, and uh, we'll stop there, and I'll see you in whatever the next part is, part four, part five. I don't know. I lost count. See you then.